the Edge by Roland Smith, Chapter 5, Call to Prayer. Several hours later, our jet touched down in Kabul. I put my Afghanistan books away as we taxied toward a small, private hangar. Rob walked down the aisle for one last check. The crepes were outstanding, I told him. In ten days, I'll make you another batch. You taking those books with you? I was just thinking about that, I answered. The books were heavy, and I doubted we'd have much reading time. I don't know what else to do with them. If you want, you can leave them here. Same crew, same jet will be picking you up. That's great, thanks. I handed them over and looked out the window. Heat waves shimmered across the tarmac. The jet came to a stop and a ground crew got to work. There was a helicopter parked outside the hangar, being refueled. We unbuckled and got up from our seats. Rob popped the door open. A blast of hot air filled the interior like he had opened a furnace door. A man wearing, khaki, wearing a khaki uniform stepped aboard with a big smile and sweat stains under his arms. Assalam alaikum. He embraced Tony. Wa alaikum assalam. Tony returned the embrace, then turned back to us. This is my very good friend Iskandar, a direct descendant of Alexander the Great. Do not listen to this foolish man. I am no such thing. If I were from the loins of Alexander, would I be but a humble immigration police officer? I think not. But we must hurry. Asr begins soon. Tony looked through the, through the doorway. The afternoon prayer starts when the shadow of an object is the same length as the object itself and lasts till sunset. Asr can be split into two sections. The preferred time is before the sun starts to turn orange, while the time of necessity is from when the sun turns orange until sunset. Imams don't look at a clock to calculate prayer times. They look at the sky. Tony, the Islamic scholar, Iskandar said. Tony smiled. Hardly, but I do think we will have time to conduct our business before the call arrives. The paperwork is in perfect order, as you will see. All you have to do is sign off on it. He took a folder out of his briefcase and handed it to Iskandar, who made himself comfortable in one of the leather seats. For all his cheerfulness, Iskandar seemed to take his job very seriously. He examined each passport and attached visas in minute detail. He pointed to J.R., Will, Jack, and me. You were all in Nepal and Tibet at the same time. We were filming on Everest, J.R. said. Did you reach the top? One of our climbing party did. But he is not here? No, J.R. answered. Iskandar looked at Mom, then at me, then back at Mom. Is this possible? Is what possible? Mom asked. That you have a son so old, you look far too young. Perhaps you are brother and sister. Mom smiled. Thank you, Iskandar. You are too kind. Iskandar looked back at me. Peak? Is that truly your given name? Truly, I said. He looked back at Mom for confirmation. She nodded. Everything appears to be in perfect order, Iskandar handed everyone their passports. There is a helicopter waiting outside, but I must caution you. There has been some trouble in the Hindu Kush. Some groups have been operating in the area this past week. I doubt they will cause you any problems, because I understand that you will have security in place. Again, this is nothing to worry about, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it to you. Now we knew where we were going, sort of. Thank you for letting us know, J.R. said. We'll keep our eyes open. A sound came from somewhere outside, a mysterious sound, a beautiful sound. We filed out of the jet onto the blistering tarmac. Our gear was being quickly transferred to a battered helicopter that looked like it had barely survived the most recent war, or maybe the war before that. The wonderful sound was the call to prayer. It seemed to come from all around on the hot, dry air. Tony pointed at a tall minaret not far from the hangar. The airport has its own mosque, or the mosque has its own airport. However you put it, the faithful don't have far to travel to pray together five times a day. Someone shouted something, and the gear transfer came to an abrupt halt as the ground crew jumped into the back of trucks and took off across the tarmac in the direction of the mosque. Tony and Iskandar headed towards Iskandar's official-looking car.
with police lights and whip antennas. Where are you going? I shouted after them. To pray, of course, Tony shouted back. I am one of those 1.6 billion Muslims I was telling you about, as are my sister and two brothers. My parents are Protestants. All of you stay where you are. We will be back soon. What's that about? Mom asked as we watched them drive away. I was talking to him about Afghanistan while you were sleeping. His parents were stationed here and in the other stands when he was growing up. I didn't bother to tell her that they had been spies. J.R. joined us. I was just talking to the helicopter pilot. He's flying us to the Wakan Corridor. Looks like we're climbing in the Pamirs. He spread a map out on the hood of a truck and pointed. The Wakan Corridor is a spit of land in the northeastern corner of Afghanistan. It's bordered by Tajikistan to the north, China to the east, and Pakistan to the south. I knew about the Pamirs from my climbing books and magazines. Most of the articles were nostalgic pieces about how great it was in the Pamirs before the most recent war. The name comes from the word Palmer, Mom said. It means either roof of the world or feet of the sun, which, depending on your perspective, means pretty much the same thing. Where did you learn that? Mom always surprises me with bits of arcane info like this. Books, she answered. When they said we were climbing in Afghanistan, I figured it was probably in the Pamirs. It's an iconic climbing area, or was, before the war. Where's the base, where's base camp? Roughly right here, J.R. pointed at a spot next to what looked like a good-sized river. The pilot doesn't speak very good English, and my Pashtun, if that's what he speaks, is non-existent. But I gathered that we're the last of the climbers to arrive. He flew another group up early this morning. I looked at Mom, and she turned to look as if she knew what I was thinking, which was, Rolf was wrong. If we were the last group of climbers, Plank didn't tell everybody about his peace climb at the exact same moment. We were on our way to Afghanistan less than, less than 24 hours after we were told. It was unlikely, correction, impossible, that 200 other climbers beat us to base camp. What do you think? I asked her. Something's not right. What are you talking about? J.R. asked. Are you sure there are 200 climbers? That's what they told me. And they didn't tell you we were climbing in the Pamirs? J.R. shook his head. All they said is that we were climbing in Afghanistan. That when we got to base camp, the film director and climb master would give us further instructions. The secrecy was to keep, and I quote, the rumors at bay and the media away. Sebastian Plank doesn't like getting scooped. And I don't like heading into the mountains blind, Mom said, which was a little ridiculous because we had all agreed to go without knowing exactly where we were going. It's not ideal, J.R. agreed. And do you have any idea who the director is, Mom asked? No, but I'm guessing it's someone with a big name. Plank hangs with Hollywood's A-list. Not that we know where we're climbing. Now, now that we know where we're climbing, I'd guess that the climb master is a local or someone from the outside with a lot of climbing experience in the Pamirs. Afternoon prayers must have ended because the pickup truck with the crew was heading back across the tarmac led by Iskandar with his emergency lights flashing. J.R. looked at his watch. I guess all our questions will be answered in about three hours. The crew got the rest of the gear loaded into the helicopter quickly. As they crammed the equipment into the small cargo hold and behind the seats, Mom grilled Tony about the climb. He knew less than J.R., which I already was aware of, but he did pass her questions on to the pilot in Pashtun. All the pilot knew was where he was dropping us off and picking us up. He was in a hurry to take off. He wanted to get back to Kabul before dark. We piled into the cramped helicopter. The rotors began to spin. Tony backed away, his red tie waving in the artificial breeze.